Mm. <laughs> okay. Yes. Good afternoon to everyone. I am Evelina Parisi from Herofins Tecna Sales Department. Herofins Tecna was founded 25 years ago and today is the competence center for mycotoxins in Aerofin Technologies Division. Today's webinar will be held by our product manager, Julia Rosa. She's going to talk to us about aflatoxin M1 in milk and international regulation. Our screening solution available for avatoxin M1 with a deep focus on ELISA automation option. Please, Julia, stage is yours. Thank you very much, Evelina, and thank you for uh, the nice introduction. Thank you to all the audience that have connected today uh, to this uh, webinar. I promise I will be very short with the, the introduction because uh, I would really like to have the time to talk to you about the aflatoxin M1 ELISA that we do have validated and approved by AUSC International and the automation solution that we are glad to present today as a really re reliable and smart solution to support routine in laboratories and dairy industries. So just before we start, I would like to let you know that you are all muted, but I do encourage you all to type your questions in the chat box at the end of my uh, presentation. Uh, I will be supported by Evelina and I will be very happy to answer your, your questions if, if we have enough time. So let us start. Uh, the, this very short uh, introduction on aflatoxin M1 uh, sources, contamination and regulation. So we all know uh, that molds grow mainly over vegetal commodities under wet and hot conditions. Nevertheless, drought is uh, stressful for plants and leads to a reduction of their capability to defend themselves against fungi. So, especially aflatoxins production is boosted under dry and hot conditions, uh, you know, during rainless, hot summer seasons. Aflatoxins are typically on-field toxins that contaminate the maize mainly, among many other vegetal commodities like fruits, nuts, spices, and so on. But I have to mention that aflatoxin growth can eventually uh, be present also in stocked products, uh, like at the end of the season, you know, just before harvesting. Uh, it's not that uncommon to find some pics of aflatoxins uh, in maize kernels when they are one year old. What happens when cows are fed with aflatoxin B1 contaminated maize? They do metabolize the native substance into a more hydrophilic compound, as you see at uh, the bottom of the slide. Uh, there is an, an oxidrile uh, residue on uh, the original molecule. This novel aflatoxin is named M1 because of um, milk. And this more hydrophilic compound is excreted in milk with a carryover ratio that depends on manufacturers, um, the health of the cow, the um, age and uh, hormonal um, uh, situation, but it ranges between two and 6%. And although the purpose of this metabolic path of cows is actually the detoxification of the native toxin, the aflatoxin M1, is still classified as cancerogenic. In terms of regulations, the word is divided into two main groups. The European Union, on one hand, established the maximum aflatoxin concentration at 0.05 microgram per kilogram of milk. And 
as low as it, as it may seem, this limit is reduced at 0 0.025 uh, microgram per kilogram for infant formulae and um, dietary foods for infants with a special needs. It is a very restrictive um, limitation. And same levels are adopted by some other countries, uh, by many neighbor countries, but also far countries. Uh, although I have to mention that some of these countries have modified their limit over the time, um, especially when it was the case to match with uh, their, you know, contingent contamination uh, and local outbreaks uh, to prevent and protect the domestic production. What is, and fourth and the rest of the world, a similar um, regulation? Well, the Food and Drug Administration limit is in force on the rest of the world. And uh, the limit prescribed by FDA is 10 times higher than the one in place in Europe. And this level has been adopted by US and Canada, Latin America, apart from Chile, China, many other Asiatic countries, and most of the Arabic countries. So there is a certain gap between the two regulations, a uh, uh, different uh, way of handling. Are we able to provide uh, such a sensitive solution to match also the European regulation? Let me present uh, our ELISA test kit that has been certified for aflatoxin M1. You will discover, if you're not familiar with it, that it is definitely much more uh, sensitive than, than needed for the European uh, regulation. Ice cream Afla M1 milk is the world first AUC international performance tested method for the quantitative research of aflatoxin M1 in bovine raw milk and powdered milk. The assay was actually uh, developed around 20 years ago here in the laboratories that we have in Italy and it was conceived following the ISO 14675 of 2003 and its prescriptions. So uh, with this we realize that as kit raw milk can be analyzed directly within 24 hours after milking or it can be stabilized with some preservatives and stored for delayed analysis. It is possible to analyze the milk directly in the assay as it is with the, its natural content of fat, or it can be processed with a centrifugation sap to remove the fat as it is actually prescribed by the ISO guideline. The assay is 75 minutes long and consists of three incubation. Uh, it will be very brief in this description. The first incubation is the binding reaction between the antibodies coupled to the solid phase and the M1 molecules in the standards or samples. And the second incubation, um, there is the competition of one enzyme conjugate that is a competitor for the same binding regions of the antibodies. And finally, the third incubation. Uh, a colorless substrate is converted into a blue product by the conjugate that has remained um, coupled to the plastic of the wells. The color intensity is then inversely proportional to the aflatoxin concentration in the standards or samples. And by adding the stop solution as the very last step of the analysis. The reaction is blocked, the color changes from blue to yellow, and results are obtained by means of a reader equipped by a filter at 450 nanometers. Data can be finally calculated by means of almost each um, type of software, but also with a spreadsheet that we have available for free on our website. The kit includes seven standards to cover the range from 5 to 250 nanograms per liter of milk. So 
far more sensitive than the European requirement. And why do we include seven standards? Isn't this an obsolete assay layout? That is because the kit, as I was mentioning earlier, was projected since the beginning to match with this ISA guideline. This table that you can see here in the slide compares the list of requirements from the ISO guideline in terms of performances, sensitivity, selectivity of the assay, curve positioning, kit components that must be included in the, in the box, and the features of ice cream offline one milk. And you see that all the requirements are perfectly fulfilled. One note uh, that I feel important regards the possibility to extend also the measuring range with a dilution of milk and therefore match also the FDA requirements that are less strict and less sensitive than the European one. As for the rest, you see a perfect match of the kit to the ISO prescriptions. This is the AUEC certificate uh, of the kit. It was achieved in July 2020 by my colleagues from the R&D. And today, what I am going to provide you on the next few slides uh, is a really detailed overview of the validation protocol that was very strict, very precise. I will show the results that we uh, obtained here in Europe in Stecna Laboratories, and also those results that were confirmed as requested by AUSC, um, those results that were obtained by a third part entity on independent laboratories set in the US named QLab that uh, used this very kit for the first time during the trial. We didn't know each other and uh, they were requested to confirm, to, to run the analysis, of course, on a blind scheme and to provide their results to, to confirm our claim. So let us enter together in, inside this path that brought us the certification. As a first step, IUSC requested to, to us, to European Stecna researchers, um, to run a calibration study. So we obtained six curves and different days. Two different operators were involved and uh, we used also two different reading machines. The table here shows the inhibition values expressed as B over B0 of each standard obtained uh, for each of the six, six curves. And then you get the mean result, the mean inhibition, the standard deviation, and what is, in my vision, really interesting, the coefficient of variation. Because these data show an excellent intermediate reproducibility. And indeed, this is the graph that you see um, on the left side of the slide. Uh, it's an overlay of six curves, but I actually do see just one. And uh, they are totally one over each other. Also, let me mention that the shape of this curve is very good with a very long linear range. That is the key for accurate and precise results. There are no flat portions at the beginning or at the end of the curve uh, that usually when you see those very flat portions, um, they are typical attempts to extend the measuring range uh, of an antibody that is naturally shorter. And this is uh, just something misleading and um, actually leading to non-accurate and not reliable results. Um, this is a very good uh, curve shape. The second task uh, regarded the investigation of the method selectivity. So the question is, is the kit fully specific to the detection of aflatoxin M1? Or uh, what if other compounds are in the samples and can we expect any interference from them? So we used one negative milk that was non-contaminated and uh, it was verified through um, instrumental analysis. 
and we spiked with both aflatoxin M1, that is our target, and aflatoxin M2, that derives from aflatoxin B2 in maize. And we used a concentration of 100 nanogram per liter, and we did the spiking experiments separately. Well, you see that we obtain uh, uh, pretty accurate results with the spiking for aflatoxin M1. We weren't able to detect aflatoxin M2, even if it is a really relevant concentration. So the closest molecule that is M2 aflatoxin does not show any relevant interference. But that's not finished, definitely. The blank material was uh, used for spiking experiments. Um, this time we spiked 10,000 nanogram per liter of native aflatoxins, fumanizin, vomitoxin, ocrotoxin, zuralinone, serigmatocystin. And these substances were fortified to stress the method and confirm the specificity. The assay was actually uh, not affected by any mycotoxin presence apart from b1 and g1 that actually uh, of course it makes sense because they are the closest among these list uh, to aflatoxin m1 in terms of chemical structure but in the end the result showed uh, less than 0.2 percent of interference so really nothing the kit maintained its specificity the last very challenging experiment was the verification of the maintenance of the dosage of aflatoxin M1 in co-presence with native toxins. So we capped this 100 nanogram per liter of aflatoxin M1 and mixed it with 10,000 nanogram per liter of other native toxins. And we created, of course, a totally unrealistic environment. This was an exercise and possibly due to a huge effect, a negative interference was found when M1 was mixed with native aflatoxins, while for the rest of Dawn and Zirulinone, we had no interference at all. So we, we investigated what happened if we reduced the concentration of B and G aflatoxins to similar concentration to match the concentration of aflatoxin M1, that is still an unnatural situation it, it cannot happen in reality in, in the cow milk. And in this time, the interference disappeared. So in the end, at, uh, at the end of this very long path, the conclusion is that uh, there is no relevant interference to the dosage of any compound that realistically could be co-present in milk together with aflatoxin M1. The assay is selective to M1 only. So the very heart of the study is obviously the metric study. We started assessing the performances of the assay for raw milk. Samples were spiked at four, five different concentrations to cover the whole measuring range. And we used four different procedures for protocols as indeed on the kit insert, as it, it is mentioned and it is given the, the possibility to, to end user to select the procedure they prefer, uh, milk can be analyzed as fresh or stabilized, so two conditions, whole with natural content of fat or defeated by centrifugation. And so we have four different conditions. Two readers and two technicians were involved in the assessment, analyzing samples as blind coded and running five replicates each. And the tables that you see here summarize the results that we obtained with the four protocols. And you see the average results are pretty accurate, really, really much accurate. And also you see a full comparability among the four protocols. Uh, there are no significant differences uh, between um, analyzing fresh or stabilized milk, uh, skimmed or, or not, or whole, uh, or whole milk. 
These results were obtained by European Tecna technicians. What happened outside the Tecna and QLab? QLab, that is set in the US, used local American fresh milk samples and uh, they verify the performances by following two of the available pr protocols. And you see in the orange box, very similar recoveries and excellent repeatability were found. So the standard deviation were very, very um, little. And thanks to this demonstration, we, we uh, had the confirmation that results are absolutely transferable from us to another side, no matter which is the milk involved, no matter which is the protocol and no matter which is the, the technician, because uh, yes, it was the first time that they used this kit. To complete the metric study for milk, the limit of detection and limit of quantifications were obviously assessed. And once the LQ was estimated with this formula as a mean response of blank materials plus 10 standard deviation, a confirmation was run by spiking at a closer concentration, a close uh, at a close uh, quantity to verify that really the assay is capable to detect and quantify um, the estimated LQ. So this is the table with results that we got for 10 replicates of blank materials and calculation of different LQ depending again on the sample treatment. We always maintain the four conditions Calculation was the results and calculation was actually very close one to each other, no matter which was the protocol. The LOD turned to be around three, four nanogram per liter, and the LOQ was estimated to be five. So we decided to go on a five PPT spiking experiment. And we were able to confirm that the assay consistently and accurately detected this concentration, actually, no matter which was the um, uh, sample preparation. And again, we had these results confirmed by QLab, always by means of, of obviously local fresh milk that in their hands gave even a lower matrix effect, but we want to be prudent and keep five nanogram per liter as an LOQ. The metric study was then run for powdered milk. Uh, the samples were reconstituted with water and treated like they were liquid milk. So again, we assessed uh, the LOD and LOQ similarly to fresh milk by confirming the LOQ with a fortification experiment. And we obtained, you see already in the table, very similar results for this matrix in comparison to the, the results we had on milk. To verify the accuracy and precision, we were able this time to use reference and control materials at different concentration. We tried to cover the whole measuring range of the assay. With this respect to liquid fresh milk, we had here the chance to compare, finally, uh, the performances of the kit with instrumental analysis, as this is how assigned concentration are obtained for reference and control materials. Again, in the table that you see, we are expressing the concentration in terms of reconstituted milk. We got very good results. These are collected in the European Techno Laboratories and were also confirmed by the independent entity. What did we do? This time we were able to share two materials being them available as stable powders so we could ship them to the QLab. Plus, you see in the last row of the, um, of the table, QLab used an extra sample to enlarge also the verification study. And they selected one having a concentration really close to the European regulation. So once more, we obtain excellent accuracy and precision. And this is also how we can demonstrate the correlation to HPLC and LCMSMS analysis. 
what was needed to formalize the AUSC verification. It was necessary to demonstrate the lot-to-lot -lot consistency and stability of the kit. So questions are, when are the kit batches equal one to each other? Because we rely on a polyclonal antibody, maybe purification or coating could lead to different results, batch over batch. Second question, are the performances of a kit equal during the time? I mean, when it's freshly released, manufactured, at the middle of its life or close to the expiration. To reach the goal, we used three different kit batches and we chose them at different ages. So freshly made, half-life and close to expiration. We run the curves, obviously, and that we, they, we verify that they were always compliant and overlaid. Besides, we used a blank milk that uh, was used as negative and fortified, fortified together with the reference materials with a sign value close to the European limit. So we had all these elements to verify and compare uh, the results that we obtained on three batches at different age. But it is clear from the linear regression reported in the graph that the assay keeps exactly its performances despite the patch number and the age. And also the statistic analysis that we ran confirmed that all the data sets that we obtained were comparable one to each other. The very last aspect is the assay robustness. How is the response of the assay, since we are working with milk, when the protocol is changed or the environment is different? The incubation time could sometimes vary, especially you, we, we know when the analyst is overloaded with tasks, it's normal, for instance, I don't know, to delay the preparation of washing buffer, for instance. And also the temperature of the laboratory could vary, and this is normal. So, uh, we decided to apply a factorial design to point out which of the differences we introduce it and the protocol could lead of, to any kind of performance deviation. So, you see in the box, uh, in bold, we have the regular condition. First incubation, 45 minutes. Second incubation, that the competition, 15 minutes. We didn't include that the third incubation, it's only the development, it's not so important. More important is the assay. So regular experiments are run around 22, 20 Celsius degrees. And then you see what we tested. Shorter incubation time, longer incubation time, lower assay, um, temperature, um, environmental temperature and higher temperature using a factorial design. So um, in the end, what can I say is that the assay showed excellent results. Also when incubation absolutely time was changed, uh, this was not affecting the reliability of the results. We saw a modest influence from the temperature. And this is normal, absolutely, considering the importance of temperature over the kinetics uh, of the binding reaction. So we were always uh, able, uh, able to have compliant results, but we cannot say that different temperature is not affecting at all uh, the, um, the results. This was actually the last experiment run within the AUSC approval. And in the end, we were able to demonstrate and discuss the high accuracy, precision, and robustness of this kit. And my vision, it is not the case, uh, it, is, it is not a, a case that uh, um, this requirement was included in the verification protocol as Despite you know the the excellent robustness of ice cream of lime one milk, environmental condition, and the human factor also are very important parameters for enzyme, immunoenzymatic assay implementation. So this final chapter of the validation gives me 
a reason to bring you in the second part of this presentation that regards automation. The question is, we have a very good kit and we are confident with it, but what can we do to support the routine of dairy industries and, and laboratories? What can we offer to reduce the variability and the human mistakes? So, you know, with all the consequences, the costs and the risk of human accidents. So I am presenting the Bolt. The Bolt is a very compact, easy to use and flexible ELISA robot. It has a highly precise dispensing nozzles uh, and it hosts one plate plus a premixing pre-dilution position. But within this plate, you can uh, run in parallel multiple protocol um, if the, the, these protocols are compatible and can be hosted in the same frame. Uh, it is a robot that can be easily adopted by low and medial, medium analytical volumes. It does not represent my vision an investment that has sense you know just for big laboratories only uh, it hosts all the steps needed in any classical plate-based immunoassay so it is able to pipette it incubates it shakes it washes it warms up and reads with an integrated reader with different wavelengths filters and calculate directly the results with uh, different suitable algorithms that can be chosen. So, it is uh, an instrument that can be applied to almost every kind of ELISA. It has the right size for a uh, food laboratory. Being a closed system, you know, it ensures a protected environment uh, and these guarantees excellent assays reproducibility. It reduces the risk and the cost related, uh, you know, management for, for human mistakes. And in the end, it brings free time to the personnel. And also for the time being, I have to mention that it supports the social distance. So we have experience of it having you know colleagues that have uh, to, to split the time uh, in presence in the laboratory could cause a very huge overload to those that are present and having a machine running the assay despite uh, instead of a human being it could be really relevant um, nowadays so how does it work it is very easy samples and reagents from the kit are loaded in the machine and uh, you have to follow a layout that the software provides to the technician. Then it's sufficient to select the desired method or to match uh, the samples to different methods and let the analysis go. This is uh, really interesting, but I have a question. Um, what is what about arranging a proper program for having an ELISA run by a machine? Uh, the Bolt is actually a very easy to program um, instrument. It has a very user-friendly interface and has also a lot of degrees of freedom. You can really adjust every kind of step to obtain a very robust and consistent results. But to really support the laboratories and the industries, uh, this is exactly what has been done here in Europe in Stecna, as we fully validated the Ice Cream Offline One ELISA kit on the Bolt to be able to transfer a fully validated method that works uh, and, and we are confident about it to, to our customers. What does this mean? What is a method validation on a robot? Surely you don't need to investigate again the selectivity or I don't know, the matrix effect probably uh, because of the features of the antibody and the, um, uh, the, the reagents that are used in the kit are not modified by the fact that the steps are run automatically. 
So let us follow which were the steps that we implemented it to have this validation um, done. First, obviously, we set a proper program and we adjusted some, some of the steps because the robot has to reproduce the steps prescribed in the manual. As you can really briefly see here in the program description, you have to pipette, you have to incubate, then the wells are washed, and then uh, the other steps are run one after each other to the final read. Then, once we had uh, this program set up, it is necessary to inspect the compliancy of the sessions. We did it by comparing the curves so that we were able to obtain manually to those recorded by two different machines, not just one. One was located in our laboratory and the second one was at the customer side. So the graphs here, the graph here shows uh, the blue curves are obtained with the machines, two different units, and uh, the orange one are the manual implementation. And we have an almost compact uh, group of curves uh, um, with uh, no uncompliant results. What about the dispensing unit? How can we prevent any cross-contamination issue? You know, during manual assay implementation, disposable tips are used. Uh, this robot washes its jet after each dispensing. So we have to be very confident about having an efficient washing that um, in the end turns to be a very consistent advantage because it prevents to discard dozens of tips uh, per session. We can calculate that a routine dairy laboratory running, I don't know, around 30 samples per day wastes 15,000 tips per year. So the advantage of using just one jet is, is, uh, is pretty interesting also by an environmental point of view. But to have the uh, washing efficiency demonstrated, we made the robot dispensing random samples at different concentration following the scheme that you see here in this slide. We made sure that the blank sample, you know, pipetted just after one highly contaminated material was still detected as negative. And in this case, we were able to demonstrate that there is no influence on the result because of any improper nozzle washing. So if the, the jet is not properly washed, probably we do expect to see some carryover, some cross-contamination to the blank wells. We did never see any of these episodes and the cells in the wells dedicated to the zero standard or the zero sample. Despite the fact that the nozzle uh, had pipetted one very contaminated, highly contaminated uh, material shortly um, before. Is this sufficient? Not yet. What is the drift effect? The drift effect is a systematic mistake that is often related to ELISA robots. I don't know if you're familiar with machines, probably you know what I'm talking about. Producer, these um, drift effect produce uh, differences in results when the same solution or the same sample is pipetted close or far from the calibration and it depends uh, on, you know, some differences in the reaction time. Um, an unhandled drift can bring to false compliant or false suspect results in routine. So um, we decided to use alternate control materials to inspect the results across the whole plate. And you can see in the graphs below, so first you have the scheme that we followed and then the results that we had, no matter which is the position of a sample in the plate, 
results, absorbances, and also the dosages are very maintained, very uh, similar one to each other. We don't have uh, variability and we don't have any drift effect. Most of the uh, ELISA robots that are available sometimes, they do require to cut the analysis. Okay, you can use just six strips because if you really want to go over and use the seventh and the eighth and so on, maybe those positions that are far from the calibration could be non-accurate. This is not the case. So thanks to the proper timings and the adjustment of the protocol, you really had the same result for this material, no matter whether it is the first or the last sample that we pipette, results are exactly the same. Here I go very fast. These are the results that we obtain on spiked milk and control milk materials that were always satisfactory and comparable to those obtained manually. Uh, we do not did not expect anything different in the end. Uh, we just wanted to challenge a bit the instrument to pipette uh, many milk materials and verify that there were no differences in terms of consistency, in terms of robustness um, from, from manual implementation. What I finally want to point out is that one machine that one that was installed at the customer side was used to run around 550 row bovine milk routine samples that were loaded in the machine as they were collected from the truck, from, from the farms. So the natural content of fat was not removed um, for this routine analysis. And we wanted to see if the instrument would have suffered by any sort, I don't know, a contamination, clogging or falling, as we are aware that this could happen with some automatic solution when, when fat milk is pipetted, you know. <clears throat> it's not uh, raw bovine milk, is not like a pure extract in some solvent, uh, it has everything inside. So we really wanted to um, verify that the machine is able to pipette repeatedly um, the, the raw material, the raw milk uh, with uh, its only one jet. Uh, and this was also a way to measure the efficiency of the cleaning of the maintenance protocol and so on. So you see here the correlation between uh, the results that we obtained with the robot and those that we obtained manually. Uh, these are real samples and uh, we calculated, you see here this claim, but to run all these samples, so we, we worked with a very uh, nice but pretty huge laboratory um, and they are able to merge samples together and use one plate at the time. So to run all these materials, uh, we saved with the bolt more than 20 hours of, of work of technicians. So in the end, the, the advantage of using the bolt for M1 analysis in milk is, in my vision, dramatic, as it is possible to analyze the milk samples without running any sample preparation. No centrifugation, no dilution, no extraction, no purification. It means that the analyst is really free once the materials is somehow dropped into the tubes and inserted in the robot racks. The analysis could uh, hands run potentially by anyone with, with almost no training. And considering the current situation, this instrument looks to me a real improvement to routine analysis with plenty of advantages. It's robust, we demonstrated it. It's very compact, trust me. Helps in the performance standardization day over day um, time after time, it reduces really the accidental mistakes and consequent cost and management. What can happen exactly is just a mismatch of bottles uh, to, to have them displayed inside the racks. For the rest, 
actually the human does not interact with the machine and nothing can really happen. And since it comes with already validated methods uh, that just need to be transferred from our laboratory to yours, it is uh, really uh, a supportive solution. And uh, it also, as I was mentioning, it supports the distance in laboratory and free people to do something else and represents, trust me, a very reasonable investment. Uh, just to make a short uh, notice, the same approach that we used for aflatoxin M1 has been adopted for many other test kits that belong from European Technologies uh, network of companies. And this means that we are able to provide a turnkey solution um, with uh, that that can be used uh, really the day after the training. Uh, you have the machine, you have the installation, you have the training, and the day after you're immediately into your routine because you don't have to waste your time or to invest your time in programming, adjusting, verifying, uh, and so on. On the other hand, obviously you're always uh, free to do so and to host all the ELISA text kits that you are uh, used to have uh, manually done in your laboratory. So it's not strictly needed to use uh, the kits that we are providing. And the final minutes of this presentation, I uh, will shortly show the whole portfolio of available kits uh, that you can receive from Eurofence Technologies for Aflatoxin M1 analysis. So we extensively uh, talked today about the ice cream Afla M1 milk. Uh, just to mention that it is available in different size formats and uh, can be combined with different accessories so we are available to support you in the peak season with the bigger uh, assay format and then um, go to some smaller format when it's uh, off peak season it's up to you like it has been uh, AUSC approved it is ISO compliant it has been successfully validated on the bolt so it can be run automatically with no human intervention you can have extra milk diluent to uh, extend the measuring range and match also the FDA um, limit, limit um, regulatory limit. Plus, you can ask for the extraction buffer for cheese analysis if you want. Plus, to boost the reliability and the confidence around the, the uh, European regulatory level, you can have also supplementary standards pretty close around 50 nanogram per liter. If you are searching for an all inclusive version, there is also the ice cream afla. That's not the milk because it includes all the protocols, the procedures, the um, and the buffers also that are needed to run all these matrices, UHD milk, so pasteurized milk, um, both whole and skim, cheese and firm cheese, mozzarella cheese, that is a pasta filata cheese, yogurt. We are going to release uh, any uh, some some other um, application in the next few months. The kit relies exactly on the same reagents as the milk version. So it is just a um, sales choice, I mean. It has not been a UC approved, but uh, the reagents and the features and the performances are exactly the same that you find for the milk version. It is either compliant and validated to bold. For the lowest analytical volumes, we are able to offer the B0 kit. This is a fast immunoassay with virtual calibration. Since there is no need to span kits wells for the curve, the samples are also run in single replicate and the result is that the cost per sample dramatically drops. This is currently, to my knowledge, the most cost-efficient analytical solution available for milk analysis. 
even more than certain large flow rapid test kits that are available. And you can have also this very ELISA applied and bolt because we did the validation as well, following the same approach that I already showed you. So I'm reaching the final, uh, the, the ending of the presentation. This is the picture that I want to share with you. It's our team of women in science. Our company is currently having you know, more than 25 years of experience in this very field. Not all of them, of course, have the same years of experience because some of them are really young, but uh, this is um, an ownership, something that remains in the company and is of benefit to all of us. So we are very motivated, very excited to share with our um, customers, uh, our, our background, uh, our experience, our commitment is to use our scientific knowledge to bring uh, uh, reliable, concrete, smart solutions to laboratories and industries. Today, we can count on the support of many dairy industries that have already trusted us for decades. Uh, since the first outbreaks, you know, in the Mediterranean area and the Balkan area um, of aflatoxins B and M uh, of past years. And today also, I have the powerful support of the Eurofins family we belong now to. So, Hope it was interesting to you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for joining me. These are uh, the contact you can always write to, my personal email plus the technical assistant team email that is uh, supported by my colleague Valeria and Julia. I have also inserted here two icons that uh, brings you to our videos, our a uh, short video uh, demo for aflatoxin M1 kit run manually and the bolt presentation. So feel free to explore our YouTube channel and subscribe and follow us on our social to stay um, posted on our news. I think I've done. Evelina, I don't know if you were able to collect any question from the audience. Yes. Thank you so much, Julia, for this very detailed presentation. We will try to answer to some of the questions, considering that we are close to uh, run out of time. Of course, if uh, in the next days you will have further questions, you can feel free to write us to the web addresses that you can see on this slide. So let's start, Julia. Uh, do you have a validated application for the robot for aflatoxins in cereals? Yes, yes, I was, I was mentioning during the presentation, yes, we did the similar work uh, to validate our um, first test kits for mycotoxins, including a total of latoxins and aflatoxin B1 in cereals and nuts and fruits and so on. It was challenging because fast kits uh, are usually not easy to uh, be hosted on an automatic platform. But yes, we, we managed and we are happy with the results that we have. So we are also, um, we can transfer these methods to uh, the laboratories as well. And we have fully validated them. Yes, both for total of latoxins and B1. Okay, second question. Is it possible to remove some standards or the duplicate welds from M1 assays with the robot? Ah, uh, well, the, the um, protocol has been designed for the bolt following exactly the, the ISO prescription and the manual of the kit. But the system is open. So the answer in the end is yes. It is possible to adapt for any reason uh, the protocol to specific needs. We are able to support you in training how to use the software and to adjust the, maybe the original um, the original protocol to specific needs. 
but the, the official method is um, has been uh, developed and validated following exactly the prescription of the manual and uh, the ISO regulation. Okay, thank you. Another question, is the bolt available for rental? Sure, uh, there are many options uh, that are, uh, can be discussed with your local sales manager. Sure, we can. you can uh, rent for uh, some months and then you can decide to purchase or not. You can have... Um, um in other uh, under other conditions uh, you can um, purchase uh, yes there are many options uh, that are useful to to discuss with uh, the sales representative in your in your region and uh, but I, I i i am aware that all these opportunities uh, are available yes yes of course thank you so, as we mentioned before, we are close to conclude our hour together. Uh, if in next days you will have further questions, please don't hesitate to write us and uh, also to discover more about the aspects of our kit and uh, our Bolt robot. You can easily go into YouTube channel from Heropins Technologies and Heropins Techna. And please follow us on our LinkedIn page. So, thank you to and have a good afternoon to all of you. Hope that uh, this talk will be interesting and useful for your and your uh, needs. Thank you, Julia, and thank you all the participants. Have a nice day.